He got his PhD in 2013 and he's worked quite a lot within this range of fiscal thought patterns and he did actually produce a book called Rethinking Taxation. So that might be something to grab hold of and ask him about when you can think of questions. Um, other papers and articles have come out of that and he'll no doubt tell you what it's about. But I'm going to leave him here to start off with his own thoughts on what may he may be doing next year, which is tied up with this, and then I'll let him go off with you. And my thought is, if we cut it at nine at eight forty-five, that gives you time to go and ponder your own taxation situation <laughs> and ring up your financial experts immediately, and then warn everybody else in the building. Um, but I suggest that. So I'll let Doug deal with it himself. Um, he's in house. And I'm sure he can deal with it. So welcome, Doug. Thank you for doing it very, very much indeed. Yes, that, well, thanks very much uh, for the kind words, Robin. Um, I, I enjoyed working with you a lot. And uh, it's... Uh, <laughs> Everybody heard it, didn't they? Always a source of entertainment. Um, and uh, obviously continuing into this year. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for, for coming to this talk. Um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased so many of you have shown up after a, a very nice but large meal and uh, hopefully I'll keep you awake. So, uh, so yeah, Robin's given me uh, the introduction. So this is my question for, for this, this talk and it's, um, it's a kind of important practical question that you might want to think about, you know, when you're voting and so on uh, and it relates to the course that I'll be teaching uh, here next year which uh, I, I'm obviously supposed to be encouraging you to sign up for um, and I must have been on a real uh, kind of question kick because uh, because uh, I noticed that I've set a question for this talk and then my title for next year is actually two questions um, which uh, must have been something I was uh, uh, obsessed with at the time, um, maybe because I think you know these kinds of questions might be the sorts of things that come up with you when you're discussing politics, when you're thinking about uh, who you're going to vote for, which parties you're going to uh, support, and which politicians, and 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 so on. So um, these these are kind of practical questions, and I think they're all related to each other a bit, um, uh, which is why we can sort of consider them side by side. So uh, is it wrong to tax the rich more? Well, if you want to have a more equal society, or, uh, or if you think that um, uh, there shouldn't be a big difference between what some people in society get and what other people in society get, then, then the tax system is it's not the only way, but it is the main way that you're probably going to um, reduce inequality overall, uh, and certainly a way of um, uh, reducing inequality of income, if you're talking about an income tax. So. I guess to start out, you know, these, these are the practical issues that maybe, you know, you, you, you're interested in that have brought you here. Uh, questions about, you know, what, what kind of political view should I have? What, what sort of uh, program should I support? What kind of society do I want uh, in, in the kind of economic realm? Uh, and we can sort of take two fairly uh, extreme alternatives here. Um, and... Uh, you might get the, the, the non-egalitarians who, who might be big fans of the free market. They, uh, they might think, if, if we just let the free market do its thing, everyone will get the right amount. Um, and and we, don't need, we shouldn't be thinking about having more equality or anything like that. There's no need to worry about that. Um, and then on, on the, maybe the other uh, extreme wing, you might get the more radical egalitarians who say, well, capitalism, this is a, an evil system, a terrible system. We should ditch it and have something else instead but also there might be people who might say uh, well okay you know the, the kind of capitalist system the market system it, it seems to work fairly well uh, mm -hmm. however um, we don't like some of the things that happen as a result the inequalities and so on that, that it causes so we should intervene in it to try and correct for that uh, usually going to be through the, um, a progressive uh, tax system um, so, you know, whenever you go to vote, whenever you, you know, when you're discussing these, these things, um, you know, these, these might be uh, the, the important things you need to take a position on. Uh, so, how are you going to take your position on these things? Uh, sorry, I skipped ahead there. Um, 
so you might think about it like, oh, you know, my parents were in this camp, and so I'll, I'll do that. Or you might think, uh, this kind of society, this kind of econo economy sounds like the, uh, the sort of thing that I, that I would like to live in, would like to see um, around me. And uh, so you might sort of treat it like a bit like an aesthetic kind of choice. Um, but, uh, but political philosophers um, tend, to, tend to want a very good reason behind you know, the, uh, the view that we take on these things. And so uh, what they want to do is to, to develop theories uh, that are going to justify uh, a theory that you can justify holding, and then that theory justifies your, your sort of political um, conclusions that you draw. Uh, as, a, as a political philosopher, I quite like... Um, John Maynard Keynes's uh, quote on this. So he he was talking about the influence of, of philosophers, uh, political philosophers, and economists. And and, he, and his point is, people who think that 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 they're you know just not interested in any of this intellectual stuff, they actually will be. Um, and so you, it's a good idea to 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 learn a bit about it. So he he says practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influences are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. So people are having all these ideas and, and I guess what, what the political philosopher is partly trying to do is trying to get these things in order much more and make sure that, that they're, all, they're all good theories, that they're good arguments that people are using when they, when they go to the, you know, the, the, the voting booth. Uh, so philosophers have come up with quite a lot of different uh, theories of distributive justice, which is which is you know the way to answer these kinds of questions. Um, this this is my kind of area, and there's quite a lot of these theories. And so I, I I'm thinking oh I'd, you know it'd be great to teach on this. Um, but there's a lot of theories. How am I going to do them all in in one course? Aha! I'll I'll do two courses, and then how am I going to split them up? So this is a kind of this is just something I've made up as a way of dividing them up so that I can, uh, so that I don't have to skip any out, you know, any of the interesting and important ones. So, uh, so I've split them into the egalitarian and the non-egalitarian uh, <coughs> uh, theories as, as sort of broad camps, and um, and and the egalitarians are, are the are the people who say we we need somewhere in our theory, in in, a, in our theory yet. Something should be equalised. Um, so there's lots of different types of egalitarianism, and maybe I'll do a course on that the following year, um, talking about those ones. Um, and but for today, I'm going to talk about the uh, the non-egalitarian theories, the, the theories that say there's no particular reason why we would want to have an equal amount of anything. Um, we we here we've got a theory of justice which which doesn't require that, and this is this is a, a you know perfectly good or the best theory um, and it doesn't have any any mention of equality in it so um, and these are the theories that I'm going to talk to you about today and these are the theories that we'll be talking about in the course oh, one thing I should clarify as well is that um, I'm, I'm talking about non egalitarian theories here I, I, I'm not going to consider because uh, I don't think they're uh, um, worth considering theories that say something like um, you know, men should get more than women because men are more important than women, or something like that. So they're, all of these theories are egalitarian in a very limited kind of way, in that they all say everyone in society matters, at least. Um, so, so they're not non-egalitarian in, in, in that kind of sense. They all kind of hold that, you know, that we have a kind of basic equality. Um, but the non-egalitarian theories uh, would say, yeah, that's fine, but that doesn't mean that everyone should get an equal amount of anything. So, so, uh, so, just to let you know, I'm not, I'm not considering any racist theories or anything like that. Um, these, these are uh, all theories that respect this kind of uh, basic equality. Okay, so, so, so far, I've talked about the kind of policies that, that maybe you're interested in. I've talked about the, the kind of theories that I've divided things into. And wouldn't it be lovely and neat if the non-egalitarian theories, they all pointed towards the free market uh, kind of system, and the egalitarian theories pointed to the, um, the you know these maybe more uh, progressive or left wing programs or something like that. Um, uh, of course, you know that I'm going to say it's, it's not that simple at all. Um, it, it, in in sort of reality, 
some of the egalitarian theories can justify a degree of inequality for various uh, reasons. And, and similarly, the non-egalitarian theories um, don't ne aren't necessarily going to lead you towards that kind of free market uh, in, some mind, in some people's minds utopia. Um, and it's, even, it's probably more likely to get the, the kind of opposite uh, from non-egalitarian to a, uh, a, a kind of egalitarian policy. Uh, so that, that kind of top left to bottom right. Um, it's probably harder to go from the egalitarian theory to the, to the free market, but maybe there's someone who's tried that I don't know about. Um, but certainly uh, there's plenty of routes here that lead to some sort of, some sort of thing in the middle. So, um, so okay, so, so I'm going to be talking today about um, the theories that we'll be covering on the course. And uh, there's, there's four of them on that, on that course for next summer, but I'm going to only have time in this lecture to talk about uh, one of them. So, but I'll briefly mention the others. So one of the ones that we'll be discussing is deontic libertarianism, particularly uh, the, uh, those of you from the United States might have been more likely to have come across libertarians um, uh, in, in your social life or politically, because it's more uh, common there. And the libertarian... Um, sort of political program is it holds that the the only or the main job of government is to uh, is to provide people with uh, security and particularly to uh, protect people's private property rights uh, and so their ideal is to have uh, a, a minimal state and one that's going to enforce these uh, these these rights that they hold to be very important and otherwise leaves people free to do what they want with their, with their stuff, with their private property. Um, so uh, this is on the basis that, that people have certain natural rights uh, and they have a certain list of those natural rights that are, that are very um, important. Um, so, uh, so property, once it's uh, justly acquired from, from nature, uh, it becomes you know, someone's property and then the government shouldn't interfere with that. And similarly, you know, when when someone um, uh, you know, uh, makes makes an exchange of their 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 labour, you know, they work, um, the government shouldn't interfere with that through taxation as well. So this is this is one way that you could say no, the government shouldn't be taxing the rich more because the government needs to kind of be as small as possible. It doesn't need um, it, it. It shouldn't have. Uh, very much, uh, it doesn't need very much resources, and so uh, it, it doesn't need to tax the rich more, and it should be taxing people as little as possible um, in, in general. We'll need a bit of revenue, um, but, uh, but they'll try and uh, keep that to a minimum. So Robert Nozick is, is uh, an American philosopher who uh, is, is most associated with this kind of view. And uh, so this is the deontic version of liber uh, libertarianism, so it's it's about rights and duties, uh, and that's the basis for that political program that you might be uh, familiar with. Okay, so that's one kind of theory. The next kind of theory is says that people should get what they deserve, and, and these are known as dessert theories, and there's a certain similarity to the, the rights-based libertarian view, uh, in that both look backwards. So the the rights-based libertarian view, it looks backwards to our natural rights that we have and the transfers that we made of our property. The dessert theories look back to the sort of natural desserts, as it were, and, um, and what, what gets called dessert bases. So there's several different dessert bases. We'll discuss these on the course. Is it, you know, if you put in more effort, you should have uh, more stuff, and that's why, uh, that's why you can justify um, inequalities through that way. And some of these dessert theories uh, attempt to justify the free market. So this is one uh, theoretical route you could go down to, uh, to justify this. Uh, and, and Gregory Mankiw is my example here of, uh, of a dessert theorist. He's uh, quite a prominent economist actually um, and, and he wrote a few papers around eight or nine years ago uh, defending a, a, a sort of dessert theory approach to justify uh, the free market, and this was this was quite interesting to philosophers because uh, he published these in economic journals, 
and uh, some of this stuff was discussed by philosophers sort of 20 or 30 years earlier, so maybe if he'd have sent it to a philosophy journal, they, they, might, have, uh, they might have queried it a bit more than the economics journal did. Uh, but that's just speculation on my part, who, kn who knows. Um, so yeah, so the, there's, there's several versions of this, and we can, we can get stuck into these uh, on the course. Third type of theory that I'm just going to quickly mention is uh, what's, what's called sufficientarianism. So this is quite a long name for what in some ways is quite a simple uh, theory. So the, the kind of base, basis, uh, the, the kind of fundamental thing that, that sufficientarian theories all have is to say that there's some important threshold and what matters in terms of justice is that people are above a certain threshold. Uh, so uh, Harry Frankfurt was the person who kind of wrote, a, wrote an attack on equality, actually, that then has developed into, a, uh, into its own theory, almost. Uh, well, it has. Uh, and and so, so you know, this kind of argument says, some people think they're egalitarians, they think they want equality, but really, they just don't like poverty. So there's this threshold level of poverty, and it's bad when people are below that. It's not that we need to have equality, it's just that we need to avoid this, this where people are below this threshold. So as long as we get people above the threshold, um, we, we don't need to worry about uh, equality beyond that point. So that, that was uh, Frankfurt's sort of version of this, and now there's lots of different versions of this. So, um, so, uh, so we, again, we can, we can spend a bit of time uh, looking at that theory and whether that can justify uh, taxing the rich, um, rich less. And the, the, the one that I'm going to focus on for today's lecture is uh, consequentialist theories. So let, let's get uh, stuck into them. So uh, consequentialism uh, is, is basically a theory that says, don't, don't sort of worry about those things that have happened in the past. You know, the, you know these rights or desserts or anything like that. Um, what really matters is you know, making the world as good as possible. That's the only thing that we should be worried about. So we should be always in what we do, we should be looking to bring about the best consequences. So it's a, it's a sort of a moral theory for us as, you know, as individuals to say when, whatever I do when I'm thinking about what to do, do the thing that's going to bring about the best consequences. Uh, but it, it's also, you know, can in, in addition uh, uh, be seen as what the government should do as well. The government should be just trying to bring about the best consequences. And so uh, you might be much more likely to be familiar with utilitarianism, which is a, a fairly well-known um, moral and political theory. Uh, and, and this is the, the original consequentialist theory. Um, but the reason that I'm referring to consequentialism is because Utilitarianism has been you know, subject to a lot of attacks from you know, various critics, and so, uh, so utilitarians responded in different ways. They developed the theory in, in different directions. Uh, so, so utilitarianism uh, says um, uh, maximize total happiness is the kind of simplest way to present that, uh, what the utilitarian thinks we should always be doing. Um, and some, some consequentialists, because of the criticisms of this, they said, well, maybe it shouldn't just be happiness. You know, maybe there's other consequences that we should take into account as well. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's now lots of different, um, sort of different theories that are all under a sort of umbrella heading of, of consequentialism. Um, so, so, yeah, perhaps utilitarianism you're more likely to be um, familiar with. And utilitarianism, it's... On the face of it, it's uh, a, a quite a plausible um, mm -hmm. uh, doctrine. It's very simple. Uh, it's uh, it seems attractive, doesn't it? Because I mean, who doesn't want more happiness? This seems like a good thing, uh, bringing about more happiness. And it has a certain impartiality that we would expect of a moral theory as well. It doesn't say that uh, that my happiness matters more than your happiness or that you know, the prince's happiness matters more than the pauper's happiness. Uh, everyone's happiness is included in this, um, in this calculation uh, in, in the same way. So that seems like the sort of thing we'd expect from a, uh, a moral theory or a, a political um, uh, theory. 
so, so we can start in, in sort of switch from utilitarianism to the first of these consequentialist arguments that uh, that we're going to consider for keeping uh, the tax on the rich, uh, uh, to, to keeping that as low as possible, because uh, it comes from the founder of utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy Bentham. So uh, he trained as a lawyer. He um, I don't think he ever practiced it, but he wrote a lot afterwards. And um, in one of his books about you know what the government should be doing, how they should design the laws, he suggested there's four things that the government should be aiming to do uh, when they're thinking about what laws to have. Uh, the first thing they should be aiming for is subsistence. So making sure that everyone's got enough to keep keep going. Um, it would be really bad for the, you know, the overall happiness if people were, uh, were sort of starving and so on. Next up, it would be good to have abundance. You know, not just surviving, but some of the finer things in life. That's going to make people a lot happier, isn't it, if they've got those things as well. The third one's a bit surprising. Equality. He thought an equal society would be a happier society. So this seems to really go against me using him as someone who wants to keep the taxes uh, lower on, on the rich. Um, but I'll explain why uh, that isn't the case in a bit. And social scientists, by the way, still argue about this issue. Um, there's, there's a book from um, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, um, The Spirit Level, uh, by uh, Pickett and Wilkinson, and uh, and, and these debates go on about whether a more equal society is, is a happier one. This is a sort of empirical question, so uh, we'll leave this to the social scientists to fight out. But the fourth one is the key one for, uh, for Bentham, and that's uh, security. Um, and, and this is the one that does a, a lot of the work for us. Bentham argues that the, the laws that are providing security of person and security of private property are, are the ones that are going um, to bring about good, very good consequences overall, effectively because they're going to lead to a stronger and more successful uh, economy. Um, and, and the point he makes is you sort of get three for one on this by focusing on security. Um, uh, because this, he says the best way to achieve subsistence is to uh, protect men while they labour and make them sure of the fruits of their labour. And uh, so, uh, so by doing that, you're, you're designing the law in a way that motivates people to work in a productive manner. Um, because people themselves want to avoid starvation, you can, you can use that in your, the way you set things up. And then he provides the same argument again uh, about um, the second one here, abundance. So again, people want more than just the basics. They want to have the things that make them happy. So we set up the system to give them the incentives to, to work and save and, uh, and, and get the things that are going to make them happy. Um, so so you, you, get, you get those two by doing the, the fourth one, which is a useful one in itself. So he's got equality on his list, um, but he was, he urges caution on the on the equality uh, front um, because he says we've got to be careful. We don't try and bring about equality in a way that would uh, undermine um, social order. That would be that would be very bad for happiness if society breaks down. Um, but, but also um, because, because it will undermine these, these sort of uh, motivations and, and incentives for people to engage in the economic activity. And what he considers is a scheme to bring about uh, an, equal, uh, an equal society sort of thing, an equal amount for everyone. Um, and so, uh, so he considers a way of doing this where you work out what the average is. So we go around the room, we, uh, we investigate you all, find out uh, you know, how much you've all got, work out the average, and then anyone uh, who's got a, above the average, they get anything above that point taken away from them 
and given to the people who were above the average. So we've achieved equality in the room uh, that way. Um, and he says this this would be the way you know this is the way to achieve equality, but this would be a terrible idea if we did this sort of uh, program. Then, uh, then, then people would quickly realise that there's no point having more than the average, because when you have more than the average, the government just comes along and takes you back down to the average again. So if the government repeats this uh, enterprise. Each time the average is going to drop, and very quickly people will realise there's no reason for me to have anything at all, really, because it's just going to get taken away from me with this, with this big exercise, uh, the sort of wealth tax and redistribution exercise. Um, so eventually, there's nothing left to redistribute. So you've achieved equality, but everyone's equally poor and equally miserable. So it's not a good way to increase happiness overall. Um, so, uh, so this is the this is uh, you know, the basic version of Bentham's argument against uh, taxing the rich more. Um, and let's move forward in time a little bit to uh, who I've characterised as libertarian consequentialists. So, uh, so I said about the deontic consequentialists before. They say we've got to have this libertarian program because we've got to respect people's rights. The libertarian consequentialists say, um, if we want to bring about the best consequences, then this libertarian program is the best way to do this. Okay, so um, so so having these kinds of you know s strong property rights, having a free market system, is the way to uh, is is the way to have a, a, a kind of a, a successful society which will uh, which will overall. Um, be as as happy or whatever it is as possible. So I, I've I've picked out two of the kind of the most famous people in this sort of camp that I'm referring to as the libertarian consequentialists: um, uh, Friedrich August van Hayek and uh, Milton Friedman, who you, you might have uh, come across. They they were quite prominent um, economists uh, in in the uh, sort of early to mid 20th century, and they both sort of switched as time went on and, and, and engaged more and more with, with sort of political philosophy um, uh, and slightly left the, the kind of technical economics behind. Um, so I'm referring to them as libertarian consequentialists. Other people might refer to them and they might refer to themselves differently as uh, um, classical liberals or neoclassical liberals or something like that. But I'm, I'm putting them into this broad uh, heading here. Um, so it's just a... It's just a Nomenclature. Uh, so, so they would add to the argument from Bentham um, what they what they thought they'd picked up as economists, uh, you know, living through the times that they were living through, um, and what they wanted to to really add to to the Benthamite picture is the uh, the sort of power of the market system and what the market system can really achieve. So, um, so they wanted to emphasize that, that market pricing contains huge amounts of information about supply and demand. Um, and it also, you know, the, 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 the sort of capitalist system gives people incentives to respond to these, um, to these, uh, these signals that we're getting from the market. Um, so whoever, you know, whatever you're doing, whether you're, you know, thinking about what to buy, whether you're thinking about, you know, what what job to look for, or or whether to accept a job offer, uh, or if you're if you're sort of in business and you're thinking about you know how to organise your business, what to buy and sell, um, you 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 look at the market prices uh, and consider your options accordingly, and and go with the option that seems best for you given the prices as they are, and these prices are based on all the other people in the economy making the same kind of decisions uh, in in the same sort of way. And the market pricing um, uh, is, is either at or aiming to reach a sort of equilibrium level. Um, and the set of prices that you end up with is, uh, according to this argument, going to be the most effective allocation of resources. So it brings about the best consequences. And they were writing during the Cold War as well, so they were sort of 
contrasting the market system with the, the, the sort of socialist communist system that, that was being advocated um, uh, at the time as well. And so, um, so the, the sort of criticism of the market was, uh, this is all just chaos, right? It would be much better if there was some order in the system. So what we need is to have a central planner who's, um, who, who's going to sort everything out and make all these decisions and not just leave it to the market, given that the market has all these booms and busts and all these, these other bad effects. Wouldn't it be just much better to, to get, to get the, the experts to sort, sort it all out? And their response is to say um, that this, com this central planner, well, well, first of all, they, they might try and favour their own friends and, and their own you know, supporters and all that sort of thing. They might be corrupt in some way. But even if they're not, even if they want to bring about the best consequences, they're well-intentioned central planners, how are they going to know what use to make of any particular resource that, that they now control? Um, so so the, uh, the Forestry Commission rings them up and, and says, I've got this, you know, this, this tree that we've just, uh, we've just felled, um, what shall I do with it? And in a market system, uh, well, they're not there to be rung up, but what would happen is the person who's felled the tree would, um, would, would sell it to the person who's going to pay them the most money for it. Um, the, the central planner... Um, doesn't doesn't have that those sort of informational cues available to them. Maybe there'll be some political diktats saying let's have more you know, tractors or whatever it is. But um, but it, it's much harder for them to know that the best use of this piece of wood is to make a make a desk or make a pencil or anything like that. So so this is the um, uh, this is the uh, the additional thing that, that that this group of thinkers want to add to the to the argument um, uh, in favour of the market system and, and uh, they, tend to, they tend to be of the attitude that when the government gets involved uh, things start to go wrong. It, it has unintended consequences that even the well-intentioned government uh, agents um, uh, can't anticipate because it'll, it'll filter out uh, in ways that they didn't, um, that they didn't anticipate and resources won't end up being put to their best use. So I've given a, a very oversimplified, well, no, simplified uh, sort of uh, presentation of the Benthamite argument and the, uh, the sort of libertarian consequentialist argument that, uh, that the free market economy is going to um, bring about the best consequences um, because it, it provides the incentives for people to work, the incentives to save, and all the informational cues that people need to make good use of resources. Um, so, so that's that. Um, sorry, uh, that's, that summarises that. So, so this is this is the argument here. The consequentialist line heading straight down here. Uh, so you've got your theory. You 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 point out all these these features of how the economy works, how the world works, and so on. And this leads you to your free market conclusion, and therefore we shouldn't tax the rich anymore. Um, however, uh, consequentialism is, isn't, in general, a very dogmatic theory. The only thing that the consequentialist says is bring about the good consequences. So, um, so there's, there's a lot of scope for consequentialists to disagree I mean, first of all, they could disagree on the theoretical level. They might have a different version of consequentialism, which might lead them to a different conclusion. But even, even aside from that, um, you might end up getting to a different conclusion because you include, so you, you see the world differently, you, uh, you, um, maybe you, uh, you think differently about human nature, for example. You know, some people might think, uh, you know, people are very selfish, so we need a system which really harnesses that, whereas other people might say, well, no, I think people are pretty cooperative, and so we should harness that, and that might lead you to, uh, to different conclusions here. Um, and, uh, and you also have different schools of thought within, within political economy as well, different ideas about you know, the, the fundamental way that, that, uh, that the economy functions. And if you, if you take these different empirical 
theories about how things work, that also might lead you down a different path uh, from, from the same theory to a, a, a different uh, conclusion. Um, so, uh, and, and certainly the, there, are, there are those who would make a more progressive uh, consequentialist case. I, I should say, I mean, maybe some of them would even go so far as, as, as arguing we should have the more equal society for, uh, for, for sort of consequentialist reasons. You might get the sort of consequentialist socialists, but, but they were probably mostly the guys who said this, this central planner will do a really great job um, and, and maybe the Soviet experience hasn't helped their case. But certainly you can get the progressive consequentialist who says, um, hang on a minute, uh, I think actually if you're a consequentialist, uh, you do need to have some uh, progressive taxation and you do need to um, tax the rich more. So let's consider their argument that they might, uh, that they might present um, against the, the more um, libertarian consequentialist. So um, I think one of the things they point out is that the free market works very well for some people, but it tends to leave uh, a certain group behind. Um, maybe people who aren't very good with numbers or, or people who, who just don't fit in very well with this kind of system. Um, they, they might end up as a sort of, uh, of, a, of an underclass, and so it, it, it's li likely to lead to these sorts of uh, inequalities. And these, this group of people is going to be pretty miserable. Um, and if you add that to the, add to that the view that governments, they, they can do things that will, that will make these people less miserable than they would be in this kind of free market society. They, there's things that the government can do that might be able to help them. Those things might require some, some resources. You might need to uh, tax people to get the resources for those. Um, uh, but, but there's a degree of optimism there that maybe some of the libertarians think whenever the government does anything, it's a complete disaster. Um, uh, so if you've got a slight bit of optimism there, uh, and we can come back to that. Um, another point that they might make is... Uh, Bentham, in, in particular, he was writing at a time before the, uh, the income tax. In, in its original French, that book was written before even the income tax was, uh, was applied uh, in, in, in Britain and, I think, as far as I'm aware, every other current country. Um, so, uh, so, you know, he's got his really um, tough scheme to bring about equality through this sort of mass redistributive program which doesn't seem like a very good idea but but now we're aware of all of these other taxes um, and so we can we can use these uh, these are much smarter taxes um, that we can draw on and there's a couple of taxes in particular that I think that they would point to as being um, very uh, attractive ones to try and, and raise revenue for your your policies that are maybe going to try and help the uh, the people who do less well in the market society so the first one is, is wealth transfers. Right? What if we, um, as most countries do, uh, tax people once they've died? At that point, they don't need it anymore. They're, they're dead. So, um, so it's a, uh, and it's quite a convenient time because someone's working out what the person has. Uh, so that's a particularly uh, attractive kind of, um, kind of tax. It doesn't affect what anyone does work-wise because um, people aren't working for, for this, these windfalls that they get. Um, so, so wealth transfers uh, in this way are, um, are, are, are quite an attractive uh, approach for the progressive consequences, as well as the egalitarian, obviously, who wants, wants to have more equality in general. Um, so uh, so that's, that's one, and that's one that Bentham himself agreed with. So he said equality would be a good thing, uh, but we don't want to have this mass redistribution scheme, but maybe we can achieve it through the uh, taxing people when they die. So that was his way of, of achieving it in a, in a much more uh, longer term, gentle way. Um, uh, and, and, and then the further suggestion is, well, um, these kind of wealth transfers, why, why, why just when people die? Why not any other time as well? Um, so you could even add that in, you know, other gifts. Uh, in, in, into the mix there as well. Uh, and the other kind of tax that's going to be particularly attractive here, that the progressive consequentialists, or egalitarian as well, 
uh, would be particularly keen to um, to draw on is tax on economic rents. So, uh, so this is a, maybe a slightly more of a, um, a, a kind of technical thing, but as the name implies, it sort of uh, stems back to uh, to to land and and rental income on land. And some of the early economists, so the classical economists um, like Adam Smith and particularly David Ricardo, they pointed out that 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 um, that land seems to work in this certain way. Um, and, and this is what I'll explain with with the kind of economic rent theory. But then subsequent economic uh, uh, economists then said, well, this thing doesn't just happen with land; it also happens with other things as well. And so you might think uh, certain people's jobs and so on can generate economic rents. But I'll use the sort of a land type case to explain it. So uh, so economic rent um, is uh, it's sort of Effectively, this this idea of there being a uh, a surplus, uh, a gain to someone that someone makes beyond that which they need in order to engage in the uh, in the economic activity that they are uh, that they're considering undertaking. So let's take an example of a landlord. Um, there's someone who's got a spare room and they think I could use a bit of extra money. So I'll, uh, I'll rent this room out. And as long as I get £100 a week, I'll be happy to rent, rent out my room. They go down to their letting agent and say, uh, now I've got this room, here's a photo of it. Um, uh, you know, will you be able to find someone who's going to uh, you know, rent this room off me? And, and the letting agent jumps up, looks at the photo, says, I'm so glad you've come in. I've got five people you know, desperate for a room. Uh, you can easily get £200 a week for, for a room like this. Uh, you've just made my day. So the demand in the area is huge for this room. The landlord only wanted a hundred, they only needed £100 to rent their room. But they're going to get £200 <coughs> in, the, in, in, the, in the marketplace. Um, and so in this case, we would say that the the, the, the first £100 is sort of what they need, maybe £101 or something, to, uh, to make this transaction. Uh, and then the, the rest of it is this surplus, and that's, that's what it would be considered the, the economic rent. So if the government can tax these forms of economic rent, um, people are still going to engage in these economic transactions. So the, you know, the landlord still rents their room, they get what they needed for that. The, the tenant still gets the room for the same price. But instead of the landlord getting the surplus, now, now the government does. And then the government can use that to you know, maybe help some of these, the, the people left behind. And, um, uh, so, and there's a particular reason as well why we might be able to think that, that the government can uh, do, uh, do better with that resources. And this is based on a diminishing marginal return to money, um, and so, <clears throat> so to think about this, uh, you might be able to think about this in your own case. What what your attitude, what your sort of relationship here is between the amount of money you've got and the amount of happiness you have. If you if there's a time in your life where you are much richer or much poorer than you are now, then you can sort of run this test for yourself uh, and think about it. And maybe if if you've had a bit more of a a stable uh, economic situation, or, or if you're a bit younger and you haven't had much fluctuation, uh, then then you might think about a cross-person uh, uh, example. But but you can think about well, uh, if I get an extra ten pounds now, when I I'm, I'm as as wealthy as I am, uh, maybe if you're if you're better off now, you would say that ten pounds would have meant a lot more to me. When I was when I was poorer, and I think almost everyone is going to have a kind of curve that's something a bit like this. So when you've got less, a bit extra counts for more. So there might be the occasional person who's got the perfect, perfectly straight forty-five degree line that goes up. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't matter how well off they are, they get the same extra out of the money. But I think almost everyone is going to have a curve like this. And so 
Um, this, this is another thing the progressive um, uh, consequentialists could point to as being a reason why we should be, um, the government should be focusing more on the people who are kind of lower down in the scale um, because, because they'll get more out of that, that 10 pounds than the, than the richer person would. You know, if you give it to the, uh, the, the, the person who's homeless, maybe they can, you know, have somewhere dry for the night. Maybe they can have a hot meal rather than go hungry. If you give it to the millionaire, they put it in their pocket, forget about it. Maybe they tip someone uh, the next day with it without really thinking too much about it. So um, it's this kind, of, um, <coughs> this kind of point is another one that the progressive uh, consequentialist can, uh, can point to. Um, so I think that the progressive consequentialist would respond to the anti-tax consequentialist by saying that, in fact, we can find ways to have progressive taxation that will, uh, that will um, tax the better off more without crashing the economy um, and then use that money to, to really um, bring about better consequences than just allowing the rich to have it. So, um, so some, some final thoughts then. So if you're a consequentialist, I guess, I guess the question is, which of those arrows am I going to, do I think I should follow? You know, what, how do I think the economy works and so on? If you're a consequentialist, should you be uh, of, the, of the more libertarian type or the more progressive type? Um, and maybe your views about the political economy and so on will it impact on that. Um, so that's within those arrows. Another question is, is consequentialism the right theory? Is this the theory I even want to subscribe to? You know, I said at the start that you've got several other theories as well. Maybe the criticisms of consequentialism might make you uh, think uh, actually one of these other theories. So even if you don't take the consequentialist theory, it's interesting to think about what the consequentialist should conclude. You might meet a consequentialist and want to argue with them or something like that, or you might just be uh, interested in these kinds of things as I am. Um, but, but also, you know, we can, we can run these kinds of arguments for other theories as well and try and work out what they tell us about the tax system and other, and other important political uh, issues. So that's what we'll be uh, doing more of on the course. So I've talked mostly about consequentialism. Um, you've, had a, you've had a big meal. It's getting into the evening. You might be starting to think about your essays and so on. But I'll test you. Can, can anyone remember the other three? I haven't seen anyone taking notes. So uh, can anyone remember? Um, if you were here at that point, no, you were late. OK. <laughs> uh, so the, the other three theories, any, anyone? Um, oh, we've got. Dessert, I heard. The Nozick libertarianism. Uh, sufficient Wow, that's brilliant. Yeah, I assumed, I assumed I'd get nothing there. So uh, I'm really impressed. Um, uh, so uh, that's fantastic for me. Um, these are some references to some of the sorts of works if you were interested in consequentialist libertarian and what, uh, or, or what some of the kind of economists have said on these issues. Um, and of course, the first three that I that I mentioned in in the talk as well. Uh, and then, um, how are we doing for time? Um, uh, the, I've, I've anticipated your first question already, so <laughs> I knew that the first question would be, "How do I sign up for this course?" I, I need to I need to you know get in quick because there's only going to be so many places available. Um, and apparently, there's there's not a, a, an exact web page for it yet. So I checked today. Um, but as soon as there is, maybe in a couple of months' time, um, <clears throat> uh, you'll be able to find it if you go to this web page. So uh, that's currently going to be your best way uh, of, of finding it. So, um, so yeah. So hopefully, I've given you um, uh, given you stuff to think about about consequentialism. And, and give you a better understanding of what the course will be about um, for, uh, for next summer. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks very much for listening. And I look forward to your, your, uh, your other questions other than that one. Okay. Oh, yeah, so, um, so my original question was very, very... Uh, this is all, all reminding you of all the, all the fun we had. Um, is it wrong to tax the rich more? This is a very vague question. Uh, I've got to put my hand up 
uh, to entice you. Yes. Okay. So, so excellent. So, uh, what do you count as rich? Are we talking about income or wealth? I've I've sort of slipped between the two um, because I've kept things fairly abstract. Um, so, uh, so the uh, the sort of uh, e e economist that would be sort of working in this um, e e in this sort of consequentialist vein. Uh, there's there's an approach um, called optimal taxation, um, and they would be uh, um, uh, trying to work out the tax system that's that's uh, going to be as effective as possible. Uh, I, I think that they they've they've justified um, taxes of up to seventy or eighty percent, but I'm I don't know. Uh, what they count as rich. I don't know if there's anyone in the room who knows a bit more about about those um, uh, those those models and and, and so on uh, about who would count as rich. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I haven't looked too closely at, at these at these models, but um, uh, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think. An economist called Diamond, I think, has been reported as. Calculating that and and yeah and I, I don't know the the uh, the threshold at which above that uh, above which that applies I'm afraid so uh, we'll we'll have to look that up and maybe discuss it tomorrow or, or something like that um, uh, yes yeah, so uh, very good question to flummox me to start <laughs> to start me off um, was was there any others yeah. Go We've gone all the way from the start to the end. Um, uh, I should have got you to ask the questions in the order of the slides, <laughs> shouldn't I? So, um, uh, yeah. So, generally speaking, a, a good. Uh, so, 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 yeah. So, so, uh, maybe we wouldn't want to have any sudden changes in in the way that we tax people. We'd want to keep our tax system to be uh, uh, one that has a fairly smooth tax curve. Maybe that looks. Like that, but the in inverse, like flipped, uh, flipped through the middle. So it, um, it it starts off low, and then it can climb sooner uh, for this kind of reason, maybe. You know, because you can start to increase that amount on the on the those with more, or those who earn more, uh, and it's less likely to have any of these bad economic effects. Uh, yeah. So as a, as a kind of a uh, a rule about a good tax system. Um, yeah, you don't want to have any sudden changes at any point because then people suddenly have an incentive to stay below that that point. Whereas you want them to always have the incentive to earn more, but maybe as they earn more, you could you could take more from from them higher up, at the higher up end. So um, so yeah, I, in 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 my book that Robin kindly mentions, uh, I didn't expect him to. Um, yeah, I, I'm advocating a, a very uh, smooth curve uh, for that, for that partly that reason, um, to avoid those kind of big, uh, big thresholds. Uh, yeah. So, uh, was there a question at the back? Oh, yeah. What does security mean in this context? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, so, uh, so what what sort of thing does does Bentham mean by security um, in the uh, in, in in the sort of the work that I'm referring to, uh, I, I I think he's he's fairly fairly brief about that. Like I say, he's got voluminous writings, um, and and he is the person who invented the uh, is it called the panopticon, the the prison where the guard can watch everyone at the same time, uh, which is often taken to be a a kind of the kind of thing that you get in this sort of security state. Um, so, uh, so um, I guess I guess when you when you factor in that sort of thing, uh, you know, he might be able to justify fairly draconian things as a utilitarian if it's going to bring about the most utility. So that might be one thing uh, if that concerns you, and if that's the implication of utilitarianism, that might push you away from the the uh, the utilitarian um, uh, approach. Uh, so, uh, so this, this is what I was sort of saying about how um, there's a lot of criticisms of the kinds of things that utilitarianism might 
lead you to support in certain situations. Like it, you know, it might be right to uh, to torture someone because it brings about the best consequences overall. Uh, so, so maybe that will lead you to a bit of scepticism there. So, yeah. So, uh, sorry if that doesn't fully answer your question, but a few thoughts on the <laughs> few thoughts on the approach and um, uh, 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 Susan. Yeah. Well, there's more though. Okay, yeah, right, so um, it, there's this, uh, the, the variation in the cost of living across places where the same tax rules are going to apply. Um, uh, so in the States, you get, you get state-level taxes as well, and sometimes city-level taxes, uh, whereas here in the UK, we have um, more successful and less successful areas, and um, and we we pretty much have this you know within England and Wales we have the same tax rules for uh, for everyone. Um, so yeah, so one thought on that is that we should uh, we should adjust the tax state, the tax system accordingly. Um, I think that uh, the one one problem with that is that. Um, you, you might get a bit of an incentive for people to, to leave the more uh, economically prosperous areas and go to the cheaper areas. Um, and if you start taxing the areas differently to account for this, uh, that might interfere with those choices. So you might want, you might want people to, to move to the cheaper areas and uh, you know, bring their skills and so on to those areas and, and encourage that. So if you start taxing those areas more uh, because the cost of living is lower then um, that might have the, some of these un unintended consequences so uh, I think that might be the consequence of this response would just be to sort of uh, to make sure you've thought about what the other impacts of that of that would be but I've certainly you know heard, heard a few people say things along along those lines for uh, that kind of reason um, and uh, we had a few questions uh, at the back yet yeah, is, is it Okay, very good. So, uh, so the first question is: um, is uh, is progressive taxation um, actually always going to raise more revenue? Um, because you've you've got uh, what's known as the Laffer curve, um, and so uh, that would say once you, you you can keep on increasing the tax and you'll increase the revenue up to a point, and at that point your increasing taxes is going to repel economic activity and that will reduce the amount of, uh, of tax that you get. So one thing you could aim for with your tax system is to maximise revenue in which you'd be looking at that sort of trade-off there. Um, uh, th we're sort of talking about the, the progressives so they might not be looking to just maximise rev they, they ultimately they want to maximise the good consequences so they might be, a, depending you know, on, on the kind of empirics, they might be able to go slightly over the hump or they might not want to go all the way to the top of the hump because there might be reasons to, um, to not get as much money from tax as you, as you can. You know, it might be in some, in some instances better to let the, you know, the rich person, for instance, keep some of it for themselves and use it themselves. Um, uh, that might be the way to, to bring about more more happiness. So so yeah. So absolutely, you can you can aim at different things uh, with this. And yeah, the consequentialist at, at the final analysis wants the best consequences. They're not just looking to raise tax revenue. Um, so so that that then adds all the devil into the details, I suppose. There, yeah. Um, and, and the other question is another good one as well. So um, is this all about individuals? Um, what about family units? Uh, and, and often, when when the government works out uh, what um, what support to give to people, it's based on the household. Um, but the tax system is usually based on, in most cases, on the individual um, earner. So um, uh, yeah, so the, there might there might be there might be reasons to, to align those more um, uh, but but maybe the two cases are sufficiently different so um, uh, may, maybe there are uh, 
uh, are also good reasons to keep to keep things the same. So uh, I guess I guess this is where you you again you get into those uh, you know looking into the details and the likely effects of shifting the policies in in one direction or the or the other. So uh, if if, if do we have another uh, question? Yeah, at the back. Um, yeah, that's that's very good. That's the kind of question <laughs> you want the person who uh, says what you should have said uh, in the answer to another in the answer to another question. Yeah, so I, I completely forgot in my earlier answer that where it started, um, which was uh, with the with the case of the Wells uh, the Wells Fargo. I got uh, hung up on the Bentham um, aspect and. Uh, and, and, and yeah, I think the consequentialist is going to make this kind of point. You know, we need to set up the system to give the right incentives. Uh, and if it's a system that's going to, um, uh, to, to undermine itself, you know, undermine confidence in the, the financial system, given that's such an important part of the economy, um, uh, if it's going to you know, require huge bailouts, you know, all of these kinds of bad consequences would be ones that... Um, that, that that you definitely want to be factoring into when when you're you know thinking about how to um, you know, set up the rules about uh, I mean the the basic property rules but also governments you know are involved in regulation uh, and, and and in terms of the, the financial sector that's uh, that's gonna that's gonna be a, a big part of these rules so uh, so yes yeah. I, 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 I forgot that that where that original question came from. Um, so so yes. Uh, so thanks very much for that for for, for both of you. <laughs> um, any any others? At all? Who's, who's oh, Donald Donald Trump. Donald Trump. Oh, okay. Uh, I I must admit I haven't been following it that um, that that closely. Um, uh, but I don't know if it's the same one where I saw the likely implications of um, of of whether that was the same one or not. Uh, but there was a distributive sort of analysis of uh, this tax cut, which uh, which benefited the rich immensely <laughs> and made very uh, little benefit to the poor. So um, so uh, yeah. So I suppose if you're if you're the sort of um, rich person and you don't really care about which of these theories is true uh, you just want to reduce the tax for your own selfish interests uh, you might be inclined to support the the kind of philosophers the kind of think tanks who advocate for some of those theories that I started with there um, who are the kind that might be trying to uh, argue for that sort of thing um, and you might also be inclined to uh, support the economists who make the kind of assumptions as well that lead you to the uh, to the conclusion that, that you wanted and people who take a strong position on the other side might choose different economists for that side so I, I've kind of uh, ended up waffling on but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure my own uh, <laughs> my own view would would be uh, very unfavorable to the kind of change that Trump was bringing in there uh, and, and uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this kind of uh, question. Um, so on the one hand, you've you've got the issue of the the tax rate. It could be it could be progressive, which is kind of what I focused on, or it could be proportionate, like the flat tax advocates say. You know, everyone should pay the same percentage. Um, that should be the aim. Um, uh, and then there's there's the other uh, the other big question. Uh, one of the other big questions is um, is what the tax base should be. So what what do you uh, calculate it on? Right. So um, so you could you could focus on one thing. You could focus on income, and uh, and, and you could do that. Uh, and, but consumption is another thing that some uh, economists and, and occasional political philosophers have advocated for. So maybe a consumption tax might have some of the uh, implications that you're sort of indicating um, oh no no so that would that would tax people more if they're consuming more so it tax people yeah. less if they're saving more um, uh, whereas uh, so actually so maybe maybe that would push you more towards 
an income tax to say it's it's when it's being earned um, is is the important thing. Um, uh, so so there's there's big discussions about that, and most countries go for a real mixture of lots of different ones. Uh, at that sort of either flat levels or, or relatively low levels, and then they found they found that this is this is a way where you can raise quite a lot of revenue, um, and most countries it's sort of slightly progressive, so it's 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 more in this progressive realm, um, but uh, but uh, but but you know some egalitarians and progressive consequentialists would want overall to have a much more targeted and progressive system uh, than this. You know, maybe this is the path of least resistance for the politicians in some in some cases. So uh, maybe I need to think more about uh, uh, your question in terms of um, uh, the... Okay, yeah, so that's another, uh, another big issue about your tax system. Um, what you what you can do with your policies, including taxation, is to try and push people towards certain kinds of activities. And particularly with the tax system, there's always a temptation to to do that and say, well, um, we we want more people to to be small business owners, so we'll we'll reduce the taxes on people who have their own business versus people who work, you know, for the for the university or the government or someone like that who has a kind of nine to five job type uh, situation, um, and so uh, so yeah, I guess the kind of argument that you you get from this progress uh, for this consequentialist view would be uh, maybe we could take a bit of a hit on the taxes in the short term in order to push the economy towards what we want it to be like in the longer term. Um, so, uh, and a, a lot of industries themselves are going to try and argue for tax breaks on that basis. You know, the film industry says, "Let us make films for free. Uh, don't tax, you know, our people when we do it, and don't tax us on the revenues or however they, you know, however it's going to be done." Um, and then you'll end up with a really successful film industry, and then there'll be, you know, and then there'll be loads of jobs and and so on and so forth. So, um, uh, so 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 yeah, I guess within the uh, within the consequentialist. Uh, approach, you know, that that would be something that you could frame in consequentialist terms. I think people like Friedman and Hayek would say this is a really bad idea. When you start giving, treating different groups differently, you're encouraging the economy. It's better to leave the economy, keep things the same for everyone as much as possible, and then the film industry will be the right size for the film industry. You won't end up making too many films or something like that. So when you get all these special interests, they end up getting special rules. Um, and first of all, you make the system more complicated, and um, but also it, it might end up having these unintended consequences that uh, that you you know it's, it sounded like you get better consequences, but actually something else is going to happen along the way that you didn't think of, and it won't work out that well. So um, uh, okay, yeah. So so um, so federal countries like the United States and Germany are quite popular with tax economists uh, and researchers because they, when the states do different things, uh, the economists can come along and see what happens because there's, there's not many instances where they get this kind of data. So when one state does something different, they can check whether anything happens at the border, where, whether you know, people move and, uh, and, and start working in different ways and, and so on. So, uh, so it sounds like in the United States... Some states are more focused on the consumption tax base through the sales tax, uh, and other states, uh, rather than supplementing the federal income tax, they don't do anything in addition to that, um, uh, and they rely on the sales tax. And, and others maybe use the income tax a bit, uh, a bit, a bit more um, uh, for that reason. So. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's interesting to researchers when these changes happen. Um, and so, you know, some people do make this this case. Well, well, this is good. You know, people get the choice to go to the place with the um, the, the system that suits them. Uh, uh, I think the worry about that kind of thing is you end up with a race to the bottom. <laughs> uh, the, 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 Not necessarily. The, the lower. T um, yeah. Well, well, people decide what to do on all, for all sorts of reasons, and maybe in some cases the tax system is. 
part of those decisions. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I think we could say the consequentialist wants to set these things up to bring about the best consequences, uh, and the other theorists are you know trying to you know, match with their ideal as well. Uh, so I think that's a, a nice place to. Uh, I've gone slightly over with the question. So thank you for bearing with me, and thank you for listening. Uh, it's been a good time.